Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. It was a gray, mild evening off the coast of Jamaica in early October 1679. The light was failing, and the humid air had been cut by a day of steady rainfall. Four ships lay at anchor, rolling slightly and quietly. The men sauntered around the deck, enjoying the cooling air and refreshing breeze. Some sailors repaired sails or tarred lengths of hemp rope. Gunners examined their guns for any sign of rust or damage, while the least lucky among them worked at the pumps below decks. Most of the men relaxed, though. They had full holds, full bellies, and casks of rum or wine at their disposal. Soon they'd have full purses. They were sleeping or sipping at that wine. Some of them were playing cards or singing, and even those at work had a cup by their side and weren't too concerned with the task at hand. Nobody dared sing too loudly, though. They kept their merriment in check. Even here, at rest, every ship had a man who wasn't drinking up in the rigging. He was the sharpest-eyed man on board, and he kept those eyes trained on the harbor at Port Royal. The city was a beacon of lamplight in the distance, and... Even out here they could hear the sound of song and laughter echoing across the waves. Sometimes the crack of an occasional flintlock shot cut through it all, but soon the sounds of men and women enjoying themselves returned. Those in the rigging were watching the harbor for any sign of a vessel heading in their direction. Now it was late for any ships to be leaving the harbor, but a boat with lanterns dimmed might just be ferrying soldiers out to meet with them. Or it could mean that their messenger was returning. Earlier in the day, their commander, Captain John Coxon, sent a few men into town to meet with representatives of the merchants and the Council of Jamaica. Any time, they were expected back. That they weren't already back suggested one of three possibilities. First, they were possibly still meeting with the men that they'd been sent to see. Second, they could be meeting with some women that they weren't sent to see. Or third, and... Equally as possible as the first two, they were currently chained up in a cell beneath Fort Charles. Now this was a calculated risk, sending the men to treat with the local officials, but it was necessary. Their holds were full of cargo so rich that it necessitated an unusual amount of care. This wasn't just some cotton and tobacco with a little bit of logwood, and they couldn't just bribe the harbor master and be about their way. It would be impossible to unload at the docks without the authorities taking notice of their chests and asking questions that required an answer. Part of the problem was their commander. John Coxon was a well-known figure in Port Royal. He was notorious from Campeche to Havana to Cartagena and far beyond. The governors of Port Royal and Tortuga knew his arrival meant usually potential trouble for them, but... The merchants and the prostitutes in those towns saw him and smelled money. But after his attack on Santa Marta two years prior, he was a wanted man in nearly every city in the West Indies. But then, in a city like Port Royal, a man of his talents was always welcome, even if the king and the governor had ordered his head. That is, if he had something to offer. This is episode 38, Weeds or Hydras. Back in 1677, Captain John Coxon, along with Captain Lagarde and a host of other French and English pirates, had sacked a Spanish town and carried off the governor, the local bishop, a friar, and a dozen or so other notable hostages. Now, he'd created quite a stir here, and the Council of Jamaica even had to pass a law prohibiting any English privateers from serving under foreign flags or accepting foreign commissions. Now, Captain Coxon did the sensible thing and spent months drinking in Port Royal and gambling and spending his nights in pleasurable company. It's possible that he, in those months, traded with the logwood cutters in the Bay of Campeche, as so many former buccaneers did in the 1670s, or even sent a crew to chop and carry the stuff himself. But by the summer of 1679, he'd grown tired of that life and organized a small buccaneer fleet to sail on the Bay of Honduras. These were the best captains and crews in the New World, and this was the first real raid of any size or significance since his attack on Santa Marta. 
I'm, of course, there was a smattering of Spanish ships taken here and there, and there were the Spanish privateers that were taking English ships, but after the Third Anglo-Dutch War, things had really quieted down, and even more so after the French signed a treaty with them as well. So, Coxon gathered his crew together, and they decided to go full pirate. Now, it's conceivable that he actually sailed for Tortuga and sought out a letter of mark from the French, despite that law passed in Port Royal, but it's unlikely he got one. The French governor was at peace with Spain, and they were aware of the new law in Jamaica, so he wasn't likely to hand out commissions to Englishmen. Plus, that new governor in Jamaica wasn't the sort of man to overlook that sort of slight. After Lord Vaughan had sailed for England in disgrace, Sir Henry Morgan had taken up the office of governor for the second time. This was only an interim position, though, doing his duty as lieutenant governor. After a few months, the new governor arrived. This was Lord Charles Howard, 1st Earl of Carlisle, and he was an illustrious military man. His was an old house, with deep ties to the House of Stuart. His great great-grandfather had been engaged to wed Mary, Queen of Scots, for which Queen Elizabeth had him imprisoned. So, his great-great-grandfather took part in the Rodolphi plot to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. Now, the family was deeply Catholic, even through the reign of Elizabeth and into the early days of the Stuarts, though they did have close ties with the royal family and the Scottish noble houses. Now, during the Civil War, they fought on the Royalist side, but the young Charles Howard, the man who would become the first Earl of Carlisle, took the pragmatic approach and chose to join up with the winning side. He conformed to the Anglican Church, and he threw his lot in with Cromwell and the Commonwealth. He bought Carlisle Castle in the county Cumberland, which once served as a fort along Hadrian's Wall and stands virtually on the border with Scotland. It's a... Uh, squat, square, tough-looking castle, which was perfect for Charles Howard. He was a tough military man. He was a soldier. He was also an officer and a gentleman. So Howard was made the Sheriff of Cumberland, and then raised to Governor of the province, and then he was elected to be a Minister of Parliament. While there, he served on the Bare Bones Parliament. After the Stuarts were restored to the throne, Charles Howard wasn't punished for joining up with the Commonwealth government, but instead he was actually rewarded for his family's loyalty during the war. Now in 1661, Charles Howard was named Baron of Gillysland, Viscount Howard of Morpeth, and Earl of Carlisle, as well as the Vice Admiral of Northumberland, Cumberland, and Durham. In 1662, he was named Joint Commissioner for the Office of Earl Marshal, and in 1663, he was appointed Ambassador to Russia, Sweden, and Denmark. Now, don't worry, you don't need to remember any of that. I just wanted to illustrate that Lord Carlisle was a big deal. He was no joke. He was actually the first man that King Charles II had chosen to replace Governor Lynch. However, he was too busy at the time being named General This and Marshal That and winning battles in the Anglo-Dutch War and covering himself in glory. He was too busy to take any position off at the end of the world. But by 1667, he thought it perhaps a good time to retire, or at least to take a position that was going to be less taxing than soldiering. Instead, he would be able to spend his days in a tropical paradise. He would be drinking wine and buying plantations and ogling the slave girls and lining his pockets. It was a cushy gig. And if he got bored with his new position, he could always send some men out to hunt pirates. Jamaica was, for a man like Lord Carlyle, a place of ample diversions. Almost as soon as he arrived, he had a little scare with the threat of a French invasion of Jamaica, but it wasn't anything serious, just something to get the blood pumping. The Spanish attacked English ships from time to time, but really, Carlyle was happy to let his lieutenant governor, Morgan, handle that sort of thing. See... Those days, in the late 1670s, were mostly quiet, and the European powers were mostly at peace. So Carlyle had an easy time of it, and he mostly just let Morgan and the council have, well, a longer leash than Lynch or Vaughn had. They were doing just a fine job. But if he was forced to be bothered with something serious, such as a local criminal, and that man came before him, that man was lucky to find himself in prison. 
and more likely he would find himself at the end of a rope. Now, if Carlyle got even a whiff of piracy, if Lieutenant Governor Morgan was sloppy enough to let some of that information get to him, Carlyle would take an active hand in the matter. Someone in that situation was sure to hang. So you can understand that John Coxon was somewhat trepidatious while his messengers were ashore announcing his piratical presence. But it was necessary for him to do so. You see, the calendar of state papers records, quote, There has been lately taken from the Spaniards by Coxon, Bartholomew Sharp, Bothing and Hawkins, with their crew, five hundred chests of indigo, a great quantity of cacao, cochineal, tortoise shell, money, and plate. Much is brought into this country already, and the rest expected. End quote. This was an uncommonly rich haul. This was the sort of prize that was only really successfully taken a handful of times by any pirates. Now, this wasn't the same as taking a treasure ship filled with gems and jewels, or the mogul ship with the princess on board, but any of these types of cargo were, well, they were usually the richest part of a typical haul. Now, the money and the plate are self-explanatory, and obviously awesome, silver and gold, maybe a few pearls or gemstones, but the other cargo might actually require some explanation. Now, cacao was just cocoa used to make chocolate, but it was still a princely delicacy for most of Europe, so it fetched a good price. The tortoise shell was just what it sounds like, but it was more valuable than you might think. Christopher Columbus wrote in his journal about the sheer number of sea turtles in the New World. His men even complained about the noise made by hundreds upon hundreds of turtles bumping up against the hull at night while their ships lay at anchor. It was so bad that many of the men were unable to sleep. Now, sea turtles and land-based tortoises were everywhere when Europeans arrived. They were, for many buccaneers, they were a major source of food. Their shells, though, were beautiful and durable. Some local native tribes used them for shields or tools, but much more often they used those shells for ornamentation. It wasn't long before those shells became all the craze back in Europe. Any lady of significance soon had to have something made from tortoise shell. There were tortoise shell pendants to be worn around the neck, but it was more commonly used to make accoutrement to a lady's needs. There were combs and there were buttons, there were mirrors inlaid with tortoise shell, there were knitting needles and little hair ornaments. But more than anything else, tortoise shell was used to make boxes. It was a common material for high-end jewelry boxes, and the like. However, if you were a truly wealthy woman, you could afford something larger. In the court of Louis XIV, the cabinet maker André Charles Bouillet was making cabinets out of ebony and mahogany and covering them with an inlaid sort of tortoise shell. He would then accent that with pearls and even sometimes silver and gold. This was the sort of thing not to be found outside of a royal court or an extremely wealthy noble family. But the money, the cacao, and the tortoise shell were, while valuable, still relatively mundane. What made this ship stand out were the other two types of cargo, indigo and cochineal. Cochineal is the extract of a certain type of insect egg that produces red dye of the top quality, Still today, it's used in modern lipstick, but it was primarily for top-quality fabrics in the 17th century. And then there were the 500 crates of indigo. Now, indigo is a dye. It's a somewhat dark and very rich indigo color, sort of a bluish purple. Now, wars had been fought over indigo and alliances betrayed. Agents of the various trading corporations, like the Dutch and English East India companies, were engaged in a decades-long sort of shadow war over East Indian spices like cinnamon cloves, and more importantly, indigo. The discovery of plants that produced indigo in the Western Hemisphere had changed that dynamic somewhat, but that hadn't diminished the value of indigo itself. But the cargo of this ship, taken in aggregate, is what stands out, to me at least. Any ship might carry a chest or two of any one of the things found on the vessel, but all of them taken together and in such quantities, these were valuable, rare luxury goods, as well as blue and red dye. It's the dye here that catches my eye specifically. For millennia, the color of one's garb had been a status symbol. 
In ancient Rome, the rarest and most illustrious color to wear was called Tyrian purple. It was made by the Phoenicians using the secretion of sea snails found only in the Mediterranean, and it's so valuable at the time that even today it's known commonly as royal purple. Purple was always the color of royalty, and even today it holds a sort of aftertaste of wealth. But indigo and the rich red dye of a cochineal, that together could cost a fortune, and it would create a color very similar to that of Tyrian purple. Now, of course, the 1600s were not ancient Rome, or even the medieval area, but a ship carrying such valuable cargo, and in such quantities, well, that must have raised a few eyebrows when John Coxon and his crew took the ship, and I have to think that they must have wondered exactly who this ship belonged to, where it was bound, and exactly what they were going to do with it. Now, those four buccaneer ships had spent a few weeks menacing the Bay of Honduras, they harassed shipping boats and merchant craft, but really they didn't take much of value until they came across that one rich prize. In that letter from the Calendar of State Papers, it recorded four captains. John Coxon, Bartholomew Sharp, a captain named Bothing, and Hawkins. Now, John Coxon had been around for a few years now, but this is one of the first mentions of the other captains. Captain Bartholomew Sharp is... Well, he was believed to have been born in London sometime around 1650. There were journal entries from some of his crewmates that suggest he took part in some privateering and even a little bit of outright piracy during and immediately after the war, but his first mention as a captain is found here. The other two captains... Well, Captain Bothing typically disappears after this mention. He may or may not be the same man as another captain that will be mentioned much later on in this story, but it's difficult to say. Now, the same goes here for this Captain Hawkins, but that one is a little bit clearer. There's no one of any real consequence named Hawkins around at this time in this story, but this is actually probably the incorrect name given for a man named Captain Richard Sawkins, who will play a very major role in the story to come. After taking this prize, though, these captains sailed for Port Royal, where we found them waiting on word from town. You see, I picture what happened to these pirates in the Bay of Honduras kind of like... Well, well kind of like a gangster movie. They're really nothing more than a bunch of small-time petty crooks. They're busy committing muggings and robberies, and maybe once in a very great while they'll burgle a house or steal a car, but nothing too major. Then, one night a night that doesn't seem any different from a regular night, they come across a man in a nice suit walking alone late at night, carrying a briefcase. They jump him, they take his wallet, his watch, and his briefcase. When they get home, they find out that he had a nice Rolex and a couple of hundred dollars in his wallet, but in his briefcase, well, when they open it up, they find it's full of pristine diamonds or evidence that the mayor's sleeping around, or the nuclear launch codes, or maybe Marcellus Wallace's soul. The point is, it's something of value, obviously. Something that could make them extremely wealthy, but something that's so rich, well, they don't really know what to do with it. I mean, obviously, they're going to sell it for a boatload of money, but it's not as simple as it seems. Not just anyone can roll up into the harbor with a Spanish ship full of indigo, for years, the Spanish had a virtual monopoly on indigo, but in the late 1600s, England was edging them out of the market pretty successfully. Now, the East India Company was very particular about who they would license to ship and trade this stuff. I mean, any reputable merchant could carry a case of this stuff to pad out his coffers. Usually, he would have to pay a fee, and it was sort of technically smuggling, but no one really noticed and no one really cared. Now, most pirates would also occasionally come across a cask of indigo and make it part of their cargo. It was a nice little boost to their haul. But a fleet of well-known pirates ferrying a ship that was literally full of this stuff? Well, that complicated matters. The English really wanted indigo. They wanted to corner the market on it. In fact, it was one of the keys to their whole geopolitical economic strategy. But they had rules about it, and they had rules about dealing with pirates. So, what was a pirate who really wanted to sell a bunch of indigo to do? That much indigo wouldn't go unnoticed by the East India Company or the government in Jamaica, and even the very best merchants that were willing to 
were unlikely to have the ready cash to buy that much indigo or the ability to fence it. So, here we find the pirates waiting offshore for the new, military-minded, pirate-hunting governor of Jamaica, Lord Carlisle, to decide how to deal with an armada of the most wanted high seas pirates in the world, carrying the richest haul of illicit goods Port Royal had seen in more than a decade. It was a tense situation. Eventually, though, the messengers did return. Lord Carlisle had sent back a measured response. He said that he could not allow pirated goods to be sold in Port Royal. He intended to come and collect the goods from the pirates, but the pirates would not profit from them. So, Captain Coxon replied that he and his men, quote, would leave their interest in Jamaica and sail to Rhode Island or to the Dutch, where they would be well entertained, end quote. Of course, for the government of Jamaica, that wouldn't do. So the governor pulled back from confiscating the contraband and instead, well, he set up patrols around the island that tended to prove completely useless. The pirates were able to smuggle all of their indigo ashore. Now it appears that the governor made a very big show of refusing the pirates and refusing their indigo and being a proper representative of the law, while, at the same time, the pirates were allowed to ferry their goods to Jamaica with virtually no resistance. Now, frankly, there's no hard evidence to support this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Carlyle received a cut of the profits himself, just as if this was a regular, proper, privateering mission. So Jamaica found itself to be a much richer place after Coxon and his men arrived, and their little armada disbanded and took some time to relax. Now, you might be wondering why John Coxon didn't just take his haul to Tortuga. After all, he'd been operating under a French commission when he'd taken Santa Marta back in 1677. Well, things had changed once again between England and France. After England signed the Second Treaty of Westminster with the Netherlands, the French and the Dutch were still at war. In an effort to encourage peace, Charles II had made overtures of war against Louis XIV. Now, they were nonsense, just bluster, but it apparently annoyed the Sun King. So, after the war was over, Louis began pushing against England. He pushed the boundaries of their alliance. He stretched the peace that they had as far as he could, and he even sent a West Indian French fleet into Jamaica's territorial waters to harass and menace the English ships there. There was, when that occurred, an island-wide panic, when invasion seemed imminent. Ultimately, it came to nothing, but that was that panic about the French that Carlyle had to deal with as soon as he became governor. The issue for men like Coxon was that France was adopting a less English-friendly foreign policy, and the pirates all knew it. Tortuga was no longer the friendly pirate haven it once had been, and they were likely as not to lose their cargo and even their freedom if they went to Tortuga. So, Port Royal got richer, and John Coxon and his men took their ease. Now, that same summer saw another familiar face arrive back in Port Royal. William Dampier returned from England after two years. In that time, he'd gotten married to a young woman named Judith and invested some of his money. Now, Dampier spent a few months getting to know his new bride, and, assumedly, starting a family, or attempting to, but shortly thereafter, he was leaving his new bride in the care of his brother and setting off, once again for Jamaica. He wouldn't see her, or England, for twelve years. Exactly why he left isn't totally clear, even in his journals. He did take with him some of the goods that would fetch a price at the logwood camps that might be worthy of going back to the New World. Perhaps this was simply meant to be a brief commercial enterprise devised by a man who knew the way of the buccaneers. However, he didn't sail for Campeche as planned after arriving in Jamaica. He instead spent his time negotiating the purchase of a house back in Dorsetshire. It took a few weeks for the sale to finalize, and he was able to spend his days idly. He was given the opportunity to join up with many legitimate trading missions, yet all of them he declined. When, finally, the sale was finished, he planned to return to England, and yet he didn't. He lingered in Port Royal. He spent his days walking around the island, sometimes drinking and often talking to men in taverns. He 
could have been back home with his wife and all of the creature comforts of domestic life. He could have been having children and building a fortune, yet he didn't. The question to me is, why exactly? Now, of course, it's possible that William Dampier was gay, or at least bisexual. In Port Royal, sexuality and traditional morality were a lot less rigid, and the buccaneers themselves were known to accept and even embrace homosexuality. Perhaps, in his days traversing the Bay of Campeche and in the Logwood camps, William Dampier had taken a lover, and perhaps he was back in Jamaica to see him again. But that's just a theory, and not even a particularly convincing theory. There's no hard evidence at all supporting it, merely speculation. It's doubtful that Dampier would actually write of that in his journals, at least doubtful that he would write of it in journals that he intended for publication, but still no evidence of it exists, so likely that wasn't the case. In their biography of Dampier, A Pirate of Exquisite Mind, Diana and Michael Preston write that Dampier was, quote, a loner who found it difficult to commit himself to either people or projects. Neither responsibility nor relationships came easily. He married, yet almost immediately left his wife for twelve years, never wrote of her, and unlike many of his time, seldom discussed sex in his narratives. His sensuality was expressed through his feelings for nature. He wrote not of carnal delights, but of lying on shore, waiting to receive the pleasure of softly wafting sea breezes. End quote. It appears to me, though, that there was something else William Dampier loved. Above all, he craved freedom. Nearly every decision he ever made furthered his own personal freedom. Freedom from servitude, service, from shackles, and even personal entanglements— and it seemed that in the West Indies he'd found a life of true freedom in the life of the buccaneers. After more than a year of turning down voyages on merchant ships and traders, he suddenly signed up on the crew of a trading voyage under a Captain Hobby. It was such an abrupt decision that it took his friends and family aback, especially his wife. She received a parcel containing two documents— First, a letter informing her that William was embarking on a voyage to the Mosquito Coast and not back to England as she expected. Second, there was the deed to her new estate. Now, Dampier's records indicate the voyage was simply a quick trip to trade with the Mosquito Indians, make a little bit of much-needed cash, and then he would return to Dorsetshire, as he intended. Now, they sailed first westward to the very tip of Jamaica, where they anchored at Negril Bay, this should have been a quick stop, and a place to rest for one last night in sight of shore before sailing on to the main. But the crew of Captain Hobby's merchant vessel saw sails on the horizon, heading in their direction. At first there was one ship, then a second, and soon it became clear that it was a small fleet. These ships ranged anywhere from brigantines jammed full of men and guns to open-decked, single-masted sloops carrying maybe ten men. It also became apparent from the quality of the ships and the quality of the men sailing them that this was a buccaneer fleet, and it was quickly bearing down on them, leaving them nowhere to run. Now, when Dampier published his journals, some decades later, he was respectable. He was a famous naturalist, he was an explorer and a scientist, he was wealthy, he was a land-owning gentleman and a scholar, so naturally, he wrote of his surprise at the fleet of buccaneers arriving so suddenly. Captain Hobby and his crew were surprised, too. Of course, no one could have anticipated an armada of the most terrifying villains in the world apparating from the fog like spectral forms haunting the cemetery on a moonlit night. But let's be real here. Everyone knew they were coming. Hobby, his crew, and yes, even William Dampier knew. They had, of course, come to Negril Bay for the express purpose of meeting the fleet. After all, why would Dampier turn down voyage after voyage only to suddenly accept one ship that almost immediately found themselves in the company of the most famous pirates of their day? And they were famous, especially in Port Royal. The two largest vessels belonged to none other than John Coxon and Bartholomew Sharp. Now, the crew of Hobby's ship immediately voted to join up with the buccaneers, and it appears that even Captain Hobby himself was coerced to join up. Now, Dampier would have you believe that he found himself in a crisis of moral dilemma. 
He wasn't the sort to join up with the buccaneers, but the crew of the Mosquito Coast voyage had all deserted him. Without friends or a ship, he, quote, was the more easily persuaded to go with them too, end quote. Now, it's possible Dampier actually was broadsided here, that he merely meant to embark on a quick merchant voyage to make some money and return home. He didn't, and he wasn't, but if you chose to believe his account, that's what he says happened. I think, and this is pure speculation, but I think he made contacts during his time at the Bay of Campeche, contacts that he reunited with during his time in Port Royal, men who knew of his worth as a sailor and of his experience on the greatest warship currently sailing the high seas. Now, when we have discussed his days amongst the logwood cutters, we mentioned that a young man named Henry Avery was also in the Bay of Campeche at the time. Isn't it at least possible that Dampier met with Avery on his voyage, perhaps even befriended him, and they discussed both of their mutual desires for something more, something truly exciting and adventurous. Maybe Avery came to Port Royal as yet a young, unknown, ambitious buccaneer and met with William Dampier in some seaside shanty over a bottle of rum. Maybe he shared the news with Dampier that a great raid was being planned, the sort of raid that hadn't been seen since Henry Morgan sacked Panama nine years earlier. All Dampier had to do was sail with the unassuming Captain Hobby to meet with the greatest buccaneers alive. Now, in this completely hypothetical situation, Dampier may have resisted. He had a wife. He had a new home. He needed to return to England and to see his estates, but... Avery might have replied. This was the opportunity of a lifetime. They were going to sea to seek real freedom and real adventure. This was an expedition that would be remembered in the history books, and a fleet of English heroes following in the footsteps of Sir Henry Morgan, Thomas Cavendish, and even, yes, Sir Francis Drake. An offer like that... I mean, could you turn it down? Maybe. It would be dangerous and uncomfortable, and you might never get your breakfast on time, but if you did turn it down, wouldn't you always wonder what could have been? It certainly wasn't the sort of offer Dampier could refuse. Or, you know, maybe he could have. There's no record of any of that. There's zero evidence that Henry Avery was personal friends with William Dampier and recruited him to join the Buccaneers. There's no evidence that he was even on this voyage under Captains Coxon and Sharp, and none that Dampier meant to join the pirates. However, something doesn't add up here to me. Now, there exists a publication that is attributed to Henry Avery, or at least... It was, at one time, attributed to Henry Avery. It's supposed to be a series of letters Avery wrote to himself, telling his own story in his own words. It's entitled, The King of Pirates. Now, it's almost certain it wasn't actually written by Avery. It's possible that the work was actually a piece of semi-factual historical fiction written by Daniel Defoe. It was published after Defoe's death, under his name, much like the general history of the pirates, but that may have just been a tool used to boost sales. There is an important line that I'd like to share from the book, though. The author, be it Defoe, Avery, or some nameless, penniless London author, writes, quote, I shall not trouble my friends with anything of my original and first introduction into the world. I leave it to you to add for yourself what you think proper to be known on that subject. And he goes on, it may be true that I may represent some particulars of my life with reserve or enlargement. End quote. And then he goes on to say that he worked in the logwood camps, but that that life of drudgery wasn't for him. He wanted nothing more than to be a master of a good ship, so he would, quote, try my hand at the cruising trade, but would be sure not to prey upon my own countrymen. End quote. Now, these weren't the words of Henry Avery, most likely, and they aren't to be trusted, but according to most reputable historians, neither are the words of William Dampier, at least not regarding his meeting with the pirates. He was lying about that. There were no archaeologists back then. There was no ivory tower gatekeeping what could be published. There weren't peer-reviewed journals. It was a question of who could tell the best story. The stories of these pirates was myth, and it was legend. It was obfuscation and fiction. In fact, as so many of the pirates themselves learned, 
being able to tell the better story, being able to tell it and convince people it was true and to listen, well, that was for them the difference between life and death. So why not? Why couldn't Henry Avery have met up on that beachside bungalow and talked William Dampier into sailing with them? Just because it's unlikely and unproven doesn't mean it's impossible. But back to what we do know and can prove. That fleet sailed back east across Jamaica to a place called Port Morant on the southeast tip of the island. They anchored there to meet, to discuss their plan, and to vote on the code. It was agreed, unanimously, that the fleet would be commanded by John Coxon on his flagship of 60 tons, 8 guns, and 97 men. He was, after all, the most experienced and most feared man among them. His second-in-command was to be Bartholomew Sharp, Dampier, for his part, joined the crew of Sharp's ship. There was also the great dolphin, a bark commanded by Captain Cornelius Essex, and another bark under Captain Thomas Maggot. There was a sloop as well under Captain Robert Allison. These were all three small vessels, no more than 18 tons and carrying no guns, only about 20 men each. So they agreed to sail under Coxon, and to the usual terms for crew and officers— Captains were to receive extra shares for the use of their ships, while carpenters, surgeons, quartermasters, they all received extra shares for their services. Now, men who lost an eye, or a left hand, or a leg, received a small compensation, while if they lost both eyes, a right hand, or both legs, they were to receive ample compensation. The death of a crewman would see his partner receive his entire share. It was all very typical stuff. The assembled crews then decided on a destination— they would attack Portobello. They had a collection of old and expired letters of mark and privateering commissions, which they all brought forward at this meeting. Now, of course, these documents wouldn't hold water if the buccaneers attacked Portobello. All of these wars were over, and what they were about was out-and-out piracy. But it was better to prove that, at one point, they had some level of legitimacy. Now, the fleet intended to meet at the Isla de Pinos, or Isle of Pines. On the way there, though, they were met by the French buccaneer Jean Rose, who had a ship of some strength and had many men to add to the fleet's number. Now, they all must have been feeling very confident at this point, but as so often happens, they were hit by a sudden and violent storm. Now, this was of particular interest to William Dampier, who'd studied as a navigator and a ship's pilot. He had a lifelong passion for the study of winds and currents, and he noted in his journal how the chaotic winds blew ships in every different direction. When you read his writings, he comes off as kind of a distant academic observer, but he was very much in the middle of a potentially deadly storm right here. This will become something of a pattern in Dampier's life, or at least in his writings. According to his account, during the most dangerous and violent moments of his life, he was typically too busy observing the birds or sea winds or some other natural phenomenon. Now, perhaps that's true, but I don't believe a word of it. Do you think his pirate comrades would look kindly on a man who was busy staring at the sky while storms ripped their ship apart, or a man who observed the migratory patterns of birds while they fought and died to take a city? At the very least, he wouldn't have been earning his pay. He did note, though, that Sharp's ship, his ship, lost her bowsprit. Coxon signaled the fleet that they were to change course and meet at the Isla Fuerte. It was closer to Cartagena than to Portobello, but it was the closest safe harbor they would find. Now, Coxon made his way to Isla Fuerte, and he found there Captain Maggot, Captain Rose, and Captain Allison waiting for him. However, the great dolphin of Captain Essex and Captain Sharp's ship... Well, they were nowhere to be seen. So Coxon ordered the fleet to wait for a few days while he and a few men went ashore to procure a few landing craft from the local Spanish fishermen and the native villages. They took several boats, a few canoes, but they refrained from any atrocities there. When he finally returned to Isla Fuerte, Coxon found Captain Essex waiting for them. Sharp, though, was still nowhere to be seen. But at least the fleet was back to its former strength, so he decided to sail on for the Isle of Pines, where they would stage their invasion of Portobello. Now Sharp, it appeared, had either missed the signal to rendezvous at Isla Fuerte, or perhaps he'd been blown totally off course and forced to sail for Ilapinos. 
When his ship arrived there, though, he did find a buccaneer ship waiting for him, though it wasn't a member of Coxon's fleet. It was the ship of Edmund Cook. He was a man who had begun his life at sea innocuously. He was likely a sailor or perhaps even an officer in the Anglo-Dutch War, but after the war he turned to a life of trade. He sailed his 130-ton ship Virgin out of London to trade with the English colonies in the West Indies. He made stops at all the respectable English islands, but finally he made his way to Jamaica. There he traded his goods for the most valuable cargo he could afford, Spanish logwood. On his way out of the West Indies, though, the Virgin was captured and boarded by the Irish-born Spanish privateer Philip Fitzgerald. From Cook's official complaint lodged in London, he was, quote, seized off Santa Lucia on Cuba by Captain Philip Fitzgerald and two other men of war, who demanded French goods, and then seized the ship and turned them all into a boat with a fortnight's provisions. They were two months and three days reaching Jamaica, and the governor of Trinidad would neither give nor sell them victuals, but bid Cook go like a dog and thief. He had forty-two tons of logwood laden at Jamaica, and the Spaniards said they had commissioned to destroy all ships that had pounds of logwood in them. All this proved in the Admiralty. End quote. So the Virgin was seized by Spain and taken into service out of Havana. Cook's lawsuit failed to make it out of the courts, though. He was then denied a letter of reprisal by King Charles the Second, and forced to return to work as a simple trader. He sailed once again for Jamaica, and then on to the Bay of Campeche, where, once again, he picked up a cargo of logwood. And then, once again, he saw Spanish sails on the horizon. This time, though, it wasn't a mere privateer, but this was the Armada de Barlovento itself, the windward fleet. Cook abandoned his ship, and he fled in a rowboat, while the Armada took his ship and sailed away with it. Lord Carlyle made note that... Many of his men, Cook's men, had been imprisoned by the Spanish and treated harshly. He knew that Captain Cook had twice had his ship commandeered by Spain, and he knew that his attempts at legitimate redress were denied back in London. Carlyle was kind enough to refer to Captain Cook as a privateer, but he had no commission. He had no letter of mark. What he had was a burning hatred for the Spanish and a desire for revenge. He took his first prize, a Spanish bark, off the coast of Aruba. It was perhaps poetic justice, but it was also necessary. The Spanish had taken his ship and marooned him on Aruba, and he needed a ride back home, so he took one. Now that ship was filled with cacao, skins, and silver. It was a fairly rich haul, especially for a first prize, and he sold it all back in Port Royal. But then, rather than return to a life of trading, he decided to try and take a few more Spanish prizes off the Spanish main. It was there that he was lying in wait when the ship of notorious buccaneer Bartholomew Sharp sailed in to meet him. It was also here that William Dampier met a man who was something of a kindred spirit. The surgeon of Cook's crew was a man named Lionel Wafer. He was possibly the only man besides Dampier on this voyage that was literate, and certainly he was the only one to have received a proper education. Now, Wafer was recently returned from a voyage to the East Indies, which Dampier knew well, and they shared... Well, they shared an unsettled, an unsatisfied quality. They both had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and experience, as well as adventure, We'll be discussing Lionel Wafer at some length in the future. He's got a fascinating story. But for now, Sharp was busy making terms with Cook. You see, Sharp knew that the fleet would be coming to Ilipinos, but he didn't know for certain that all of the ships in his fleet had survived the storm. So it was a relief to find a friendly vessel, full of violent men, waiting for him there. Now Sharp and Dampier spent their time going ashore and trading with the local natives, as did this Lionel Wafer. They became friendly, and they traded for some victuals and the like. They even managed to learn a bit about Spanish troop movements in the area. After a few days there, though, the rest of the fleet arrived. Only John Coxon's ship was actually able to make landfall at the Isle of Pines, so the rest of the fleet was forced to anchor on a nearby island called Golden Isle. Now, Cook was new to the trade, and this was a fact that John Coxon, who was at this point a veteran, well, he knew that well. 
So he decided to take Cook on, but he wanted to test him first. He ordered Cook to sail over to Golden Island and deliver the news that Coxon was ready to sail on Portobello. This should have been a simple job that anyone could accomplish. But the game was nearly ended before it began. You see, en route to Golden Isle, Cook happened upon a Spanish slave ship, and his men were divided on the question of whether to attack her or not. They changed course, and then they changed course again. They managed to lose the wind carrying them to Golden Island, so as a result, they were blown instead south into the Bay of Darien. Now this wasn't really Captain Cook's fault. The wind was still up, and the sea was still unpredictable after that storm, so he really never had a chance, but it did show a lack of authority on his part. Still, though, he got the news to the fleet eventually, and soon all of those ships set out in their boats for the Isle of Pines and onward to the coast. Now Coxon and Sharp and Dampier met them in their own boats, and this fleet of pinnaces and canoes that were carrying upwards of 250 men rode silently up the coast of Darien toward the city of Portobello. I should clear this up a little bit. This little stretch of modern-day Panama was called Darien Province at the time, and it was politically separate from the province of Panama. Now today, these are both provinces within the nation of Panama, and Darien is that province closest to modern Colombia. In 1680, it was occupied almost solely by the Kuna Indians. It was for buccaneers and smugglers and their ilk, a relatively safe place to lay anchor. It was also a good place for them to wait to attack Spanish ships. You see, the sea route between Portobello and Cartagena is fairly straight, but this Bay of Darien rests in sort of a nook, right where Central and South America meet, so it was a perfect place for buccaneers to wait and attack. So, it shouldn't have been too much of a surprise when the fleet of small boats happened across a ship at anchor and found that it actually belonged to the French buccaneer Captain Lasson. Naturally, this French buccaneer agreed to join the fleet of John Coxon and added an additional 80 men to the strike force. Now, what the hell is going on here exactly? A fleet of five ships headed out from Jamaica under Captains Coxon, Sharp, Allison, Essex, and Maggot. Then they happened across Captain Jean Rose, who joined them. Then they stumbled upon Captain Edmund Cook, who joined them. Then somehow they are surprised to find Captain Lasson on their way to attack Portobello. Their humble little fleet just magically encountered three more buccaneers planning to attack Portobello at the exact same time, and they nearly doubled their attack force? Is that what I'm hearing here? Well, maybe. That's at least how it's presented to us, but to be fair, the records here are sparse. I could accept that Sharp did actually just happen to find Captain Cook at anchor on the coast of Darien. That's not unheard of, but the two French ships give me pause. If they were privateers in the employ of their respective nations during a time of war, or had any of the captains been in possession of legitimate letters of mark, I would consider the possibility that they were sneaking around to avoid suspicion from their governments, but that they actually did plan to meet up and attack Portobello. But they weren't privateers. This wasn't a time of war, and they had no hint of legality on this mission. These were pirates, and they had no need to appease the law. No, it appears that they actually did just happen to come across three pirate ships at anchor on their way to Portobello, and that their crews were willing to join up. And it actually does kind of make sense. The sea between Portobello and Cartagena was a busy shipping route. Pirates did frequent Darien due to its lack of Spanish settlements. Then, when there was a terrible storm, that storm that scattered Coxon's fleets, well, that kept the winds up and the seas choppy. It's absolutely believable that those other captains made for land to lay anchor and wait out the storm, at which point they met up with Coxon, who had a plan to attack Portobello and make them all filthy rich. So the flotilla continued toward Portobello, 330 men strong now. They put ashore on February 4th, 1680, at the Gulf of San Blas, and began a grueling three-day march through dense jungles. It was a decent plan to avoid Spanish patrols, but they were ill-prepared for it, and the men suffered for three days, quote, without any food, and their feet cut with the rocks for want of shoes, end quote. 
yet for three days they avoided notice. Then, on February 7th, the pirates came across a native village. Now, the inhabitants there hid or huddled in fear, but the pirates weren't there to harm them. Still, one boy fled toward Portobello to raise the alarm. Coxon ordered Captain Allison to follow. You see, Allison was in command of the Forlorn, that unit that we would call the Vanguard, and he was equipped to move as quickly as possible. Now, he gave chase as best as he could, but even so, an army just cannot catch a single man. But still, he tried. Still, as Portobello came into view, the alarm bells began ringing. Allison, though, wasn't daunted. He had less than a hundred men under him, and he knew that if he waited until Coxon caught up to attack the city, he would lose the advantage of a city that was swept by confusion and fear. So he marched his men in to Portobello. Now, there was, of course, resistance, but it was disorganized and it was undisciplined, much as it had been back when Henry Morgan had taken the city. Only six of his men took wounds, and none of those fatal. The locals had been so busy fleeing to the cathedral that they hadn't had time to mount a defense or to even properly secure their valuables. So Coxon arrived shortly thereafter with the rest of the force. However, Portobello was already taken. So his men had two days to do what they did best— They entered every home, they drank all the wine, they ate all the food, and they stole everything of value. Now, it's unclear exactly how complete the evacuation to the church was and if the pirates found anyone in town, but there weren't reports of any atrocities of note. Now, let me be clear, unless the victim was a person of some prominence, it was unusual for a rape or a murder to be recorded even by the Spanish, and the pirates sure weren't going to write it down, but let's not pretend that this was a peaceful raid. Lives were ruined and ended. The pirates were Vikings. They were barbarians. These were violent men who took whatever they could by force. However, we know at the very least that this raid was nothing in terms of violence and terror compared to the voyages of Francois Lolonnais or those worst of Captain Morgan's raids. And it was brief. Two days wasn't a terribly long time to sack a city. Spanish regulars would be on their way, so they had to move quickly. Then the pirates made good their escape. They retired to a quay about ten miles to the northeast and began to erect a hasty defensive fortification. Basically, they just dug trenches on the sand from which to fire anyone that would be attacking them with something of a wall of sand to fire behind. Once again, though, Allison was sent off. This time, he was to fetch those ships at anchor up the coast. The pirates that were remaining on the beach dug in and hunkered down to wait on the Spanish soldiers that they knew were coming. When they arrived, the Spanish should have had the advantage. They had the high ground looking down on the beach, and this was, after all, their home soil. Now, they used that advantage. They fired on the pirates and kept them from escaping, but... Whenever they actually tried to advance toward the beach, they were met with a hail of musket fire that forced them back. So this turned into something of a standoff, with neither side able to overtake the other. Certainly the Spanish were waiting on reinforcements, but they came too late. On the second day, Allison arrived with five buccaneer ships carrying heavy guns, which fired on the Spanish soldiers. This was enough cover for Coxon and Sharp and all of their men to make for the ships and sail away. Then, in an act of legendary, swaggering, impudent bravado, these pirates elected not to just sail home with their spoils, but they decided to sail back to Portobello and blockade the harbor there for an additional two days. No ships were allowed out of the harbor, and any ship that arrived was surprised to suddenly find themselves at the mercy of a fleet of English and French buccaneers. They took a few ships during that blockade, and a decent amount of treasure, but nothing they thought truly spectacular. Then, with the threat of the Windward Fleet bearing down on them, John Coxon, Bartholomew Sharp, William Dampier, Robert Allison, Thomas Maggot, Cornelius Essex, Jean Rose, Edmund Cook, and Captain Lassant, sailed away from Portobello with their holds full of stolen Spanish plunder. Next time, we'll discuss the next move of this pirate fleet. They're going to encounter yet more pirates willing to follow them, and William Dampier is going to discover a treasure on board one of the ships that they took during the blockade. 
He's going to uncover a Spanish prophecy of doom. Doom at the hands of English rovers that will lead to the most daring and ambitious voyage in pirate history. My thanks to everybody for listening. I'd also like to thank everybody that has supported the show, either by donating through the website or by signing up for Patreon. And a shout-out this week to our officer class on Patreon. These are the gunners, helmsmen, navigators, and mates that are the glue that hold our crew together. So a special thank you to Kevin, Garrett, Casey, Amy, Johan, Scott, Mitch, Gunner, Karen, Benja, Grace, Luke, Brandon, and Matthew and Julia. I'd also like to thank everybody that has supported the show by leaving us a review at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever it is you listen to the show. Every little bit helps, and we couldn't do this without you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you enjoy their music, why not go on over and check them out at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can always contact us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, or YouTube. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.